Hello, I'm Lynn Hilton Wilson with Book of Mormon Central's team on Come Follow Me for the Old Testament. And today we get to look at the concluding verses of Enoch's great vision in Moses chapter 7, verses 37 to 47. And here the focus of this great vision is pointed out in a beautiful poetic structure. Those of you that know Enoch is our weeping prophet and know that this is the verses that refer to God as one who weeps and has great compassion for us, won't be surprised to find that the center point of this beautiful parallel poetry focuses on that very message. Just as a reminder, the ancients did not record what was most important to them at the beginning of a thesis statement, at the first sentence of a paragraph as we do now. And Joseph Smith certainly didn't know what a chiasmus was in, in the 19th century. Uh, nobody did at uh, that time in America, at least. But we certainly find consistent parallel fashions as he is translating this. And there's a beautiful structure where the first message is repeated as the last, and the second message is repeated second to the last, and the most important message is that central point. And as we look at this chiasmus from verse 37 to verse 40, I hope you can focus in on this middle part, which was the most important part. If you had to memorize things, it was easier sometimes to memorize them in a chiastic fashion so that you could go in with messages and then come out with the same repeated words. Verse 37 starts, the whole heavens did weep over them. It's not just the prophet and God, it's, the, it's nature. They're all weeping over them, even all the workmanship of mine hands. And the second point is mentioned here, a prison have I prepared for them. And then in verse 39, that which I have chosen hath pled before my face. And the center point, he suffered for their sins. And then as he comes out of the chiasmus, that repeats in so much that they will repent. And continuing on in verse 39, in the day that my chosen shall return unto me. So before the chosen is pleading before the face of God, and now the chosen will return unto me, and they shall be in torment is paralleled with the prison that is prepared for them. And it's prepared as a place of teaching and learning, but they're tormenting because they're missing their bodies and they're realizing their guilt. And then the parallel from the first statement is mentioned at the end of this little chiasmus, the heavens weep, yea, all the workmanship of my hands. So as we look at the conclusion of this book of Moses or um, Enoch, we see this focus on our Savior who will suffer if we can repent. The text continues on outside of this parallel beautiful poetry in Moses chapter 7 verse 41 to read, The Lord spake unto Enoch and told Enoch all the doings of the children of men, wherefore Enoch knew and he looked upon their wickedness with misery. He wept and he stretched forth his arms and his heart swelled wide as eternity and his bowels yearned and all eternity shook. As I step back and analyze this verse, it's interesting to note that Enoch's compassion grows the more he learns about the situation. The more he sees the people and understands them, the more compassion and empathy he develops. I hope we can do the same thing in our own lives as we learn about our fellow man. I also want to talk for just a minute about this destruction of the wicked. Enoch is seeing the vision of Noah and the destruction of the wicked now. Many people have looked at this destruction and the destruction multiple times throughout the Old Testament and elsewhere as a vengeful God. And how can you believe in a theology that speaks of a God who is doesn't even answer the prayers of those who are praying and doesn't even answer the needs of those people who are being destroyed by things as, as preventable as um, a war. If God has all power, why is this being allowed? But I have to ask you a different question. Is removing the wicked from the earth vengeful or merciful? If you are born in an environment where you are only seeing wickedness, if you are surrounded in an environment where you are sinning every day and maybe even every hour, wouldn't it be better to be removed from that environment where Satan's temptations are no longer part of it and you have the opportunity to have a time out and learn in another way? If you've already got your body, wouldn't you rather learn in a place that's been prepared? Doctrine and Covenants section 138 says, even those who rejected the prophets will have another chance to learn the teachings of Jesus Christ and the importance of repentance. So when I take a cosmic view 
of the destruction of Noah as flood, I do not see a vengeful God. I see a merciful God who loves his children. As we continue on in Moses chapter 7, verse 42, Enoch also saw Noah and his family and the posterity of the sons of Noah who should be saved with a temporal salvation. Some people refer to Noah as our temporal savior, which I think is beautiful in light of the fact that Noah becomes angel Gabriel. Joseph Smith taught that all the angels that minister to this earth once will be mortals on this earth. And then Gabriel has the opportunity to announce our not our temporal salvation, but our eternal salvation through our Savior, Jesus Christ. So Noah's role is beautiful in that parallel. Continuing on in the text of Moses chapter 7, verse 43, we read that upon the residue of the wicked, the floods came and swallowed them up. And in verse 44, Enoch saw this with the bitterness of soul, and he wept over his brethren, some of whom, I might add, are his grandchildren. And he said unto the heavens, I will refuse to be comforted. But the Lord said unto Enoch, lift up your heart and be glad and look. And then opens up the history and the vision of the coming of the Son of Man. This is such a powerful doctrine. I can't emphasize it enough. It reminds me of the Last Supper when the Savior says, I'm going to be killed. I'm going away. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Enoch is just beside himself in sorrow and mourning for the death of his family and brethren. And the Lord says, lift up your heart and look. Lift up your heart and realize, no matter in what state you're at, we can always rejoice in the thought that we have a Savior. So step back and take that cosmic view of the challenges of life. Verse 45 continues, Enoch looked, and from Noah he beheld all the families of the earth, and he is introduced to our Savior. He asked the Lord, when will the day of the Lord come? When will the blood of the righteous, capital R, referring to Christ, be shed? And when will they that mourn be sanctified and have eternal life? Moses chapter 7, verse 46 and verse 60 then refer to the wickedness and vengeance of the people of the world at the time of the flood. Actually, it's the Savior's first coming and the second coming. And he talks about the Savior coming in verse 47. Enoch saw the day of the coming of the Son and Man, even in the flesh, and his soul rejoiced, saying, The righteous, capital R, meaning our Lord, is lifted up, and the Lamb is slain from the foundation of the world, and through faith I am in the bosom of the Father, and behold, Zion is with me. Enoch was able to rejoice, knowing that our Savior has suffered for our sins, that we have a way to repent and receive joy, and even Enoch, after seeing this horrific destruction, received a fullness of joy. And I hope you can, too, as we ponder the things of our Savior.